Place with Matt Pinfield. Today's guest, Claudio Sanchez from Coheed and Cambria. Hey everybody, it's Matt Pinfield. This is called In a Lonely Place. And that's because I started this show during the pandemic in my living room. Well, I'm not in my living room anymore, but we're still in the pandemic. Regardless, I've been so enjoying doing this show. And, you know, I named it after a Humphrey Bogart movie from the 1950s. There's also a Smithereen song, a New Order song, all called In a Lonely Place. thought it was the perfect title. Uh, but regardless, you know, you're never lonely as long as you have music in your life. And that's what this is all about. It's about musicians uh, that I love and respect. And uh, one of the guys uh, that it's certainly on the top of my list I have as a guest today. Uh, because, you know, I, I was blessed enough and, and grateful enough to actually sign the band to Columbia Records um, and, you know, have a long term relationship uh, with the guys as a huge fan of their music. You know, I even went to this gentleman's wedding. That's right. I was there at his wedding and I will uh, say it was it was ama an amazing day. But we're going to be talking about his music and I'm really happy to have him here. And I'm talking about. Coed and Cambria's uh, Claudio Sanchez. Claudio, what's up, brother? How are you? Who are you? Where's <laughs> Matt Pinfield? I know, right? Man? <laughs> I know. Yeah, Claudio, it's amazing, man. I just like I lost all that weight and uh, been exercising, you know, just uh, six months sober, you know, and just feeling really good, you know. That's awesome, man. You know, came through that like relapse I had during the pandemic and. Uh, I'm just grateful to be healthy and, you know, be around for my friends, my loved ones, you know, and uh, speaking of friends, man, you and I go back, which I think is just so fantastic. And Hey, you know, I know your fans are really happy to see you today. How has the pandemic been for you? I mean, I know you guys had dates that were originally booked. Tell me what that experience was like, Claudio, like when you, uh, because, you know, I mean, obviously there's so many responsibilities that came with that, you know, with you being a dad with At Atlas Hendricks and, uh, you know, do homeschooling and all the other things. What's t what has it been like for you during this pandemic? Uh, you know, I've, I've tried to stay busy and I think I, I think I have been, um, you know, both my wife and I, we lost our grandparents <clears throat> during the time and we were, we couldn't actually be there for the, for the loss. My grandfather was in the hospital and, you know, we were lucky enough that my, my brother was a first responder and could be in, in there with him. But, you know, this was a man that was practically a second dad, lived with him most of my life and didn't get a chance to say goodbye. And then a month after that, Chandra found out her grandmother, who she was very close to, uh, fell ill and we couldn't get down to Florida to, to you know, say goodbye. And so those are those were the difficult moments, you know, um, you know, having our son home, we actually loved it, um, you know. You know, the time that I don't normally get when I'm on the road with him. So, uh, that part I, I liked, but, um, you know, the loss was hard, but I, I tried to stay busy and I wrote a lot of music. I wrote, you know, some music for Coheed. I wrote a record for Prize Fighter that I actually just got the test pressings for that I wrote through the pandemic. And it's, it's, uh, it was touching listening to it this morning, like kind of removed from it because it just reminded me of like the beginning of it, you know, my grandfather falling ill you know, those like questions of like, how do I get up there? And can I get up there? The lockdown of the hospital um, and losing, losing the man. He, I mean, he's lived a long life, World War II veteran, 100 years old. You know, he used to tell me, he used to tell me as a kid, like, Claude, if you want to make it in the industry, you have to have a gimmick. <laughs> and it's uh, and it's funny because sometimes I, you know, feel like in the eyes of others that don't know Coheed, it looks like a band of gimmicks because of, you know, the, con you know, the concept counterpart and my hair and, but it's, you know, I never understood like that idea. And I don't, you know, I didn't necessarily agree with them. I thought of the, I thought it was an interesting uh, thing to say. Um, it didn't feel genuine, but uh, it's funny now here we are. And I'm like, oh man, damn we might be perceived as that band that, that he was talking about, um, if that makes any sense. Now, that's amazing, though. But uh, I know a lot, that was, the, I think, the hardest thing for so many people like your, you and Chandra was, uh, you know, not being able to actually be there and, you know, have like a full-on funeral and just like that kind of thing. So, you know, 
But I'm glad that you turned it into something creative, Claudio, which you always, uh, that's always kind of been your thing that you've, you've really done. And, and you're a guy that never stands still or sits still. That's why you've, you've done so many things, whether it be graphic novels, like the Amory Wars and the things that you've worked on for all these years. Um, and, you know, so the time in between Unheavenly Creatures and, and this, I mean, you were also, you know, you, you, I remember when you did the Prize Fighter Inferno EP, and now it, this is a full length album, right? Yeah, this is a full length album. Um, it's pretty cool. Like my wife and I, before the before um, the pandemic hit, we actually closed on a house in Brooklyn, a couple of blocks from our uh, apartment, and uh, you know, and I took and the cover of the album is actually my son's hand in the uh, bathroom, um, and some of the other photo. F a photography on the record. Um, one happens to be a broken sign um, at the Brooklyn Museum after a BLM protest, um, you know, and uh, the inside is like cool light that's, you know, our house is like a hundred years old. It's like this, you know, row house. And uh, it just, it, it just, it's a, it's really a time capsule of like the experience of that of the time for, you know, my experience of the time, my family's experience of the time. And there's a song on there I wrote for my mother called stay where you are because, you know, she couldn't go to the hospital. And this is a, you know, this is her dad, um, who's lived all of her life. And, uh, and I just thought that was really hard. Um, so I created the song for her. Um, and it ends the record. Yeah. I remember when the first record came out and I heard, uh, the going price for home. And I felt, I just loved, always oh, still love that song. It's just so good. And, you know, obviously it was, it was different than what people were used to hearing. And it's, is it crazy when you think back about it now, how many years, you know, since Shibuti and, you know, uh, <laughs> when you first literally started working on second stage turbine blade and, you know, at, at that point you thought it was going to be a side project, right? I or, did. I mean, I, th I just, you know, I, it's, it's like how many lives have, I, all of us. I mean, getting to be fortunate enough to live this long, like how many lives have we lived? I feel like I'm such a different person from, you know, a lot of those songs on that first prize fighter record. I mean, they were all, you know, just four tracks in my bedroom, my high school bedroom, you know, like yeah. four track cassette tape recordings. And same thing with second stage. There was a lot, a lot of those demos were on that same four track time consumer, everything evil. It's, you know, and yeah, that record we thought was going to be a series of demos, you know, when we were demoing it to Equal Vision and, um, yeah. and they chose, you know, to sign the band and put that out. And we were like, well, all right, yeah, makes sense. It's here. It's done. <laughs> yeah. Why record it again? Um, yeah. <laughs> Which is amazing when you think about it, right? Yeah. I love, I love that. I mean, I just think about that time, you know, coheating Cambria and like, you know, the fact that they're based loosely based on my parents and the Amory Wars being the Amory, the street I was on. And the second stage turbine blade, the title is actually, I don't know if I ever told you this, Matt, but um, it's actually taken from the airplane part that my father works on at, uh, well, now that he's, re he's retired, but he used to work at a heat treatment fl uh, plant, you know, blue collar job factory, and he would heat treat second stage turbine blades for airplanes. That's amazing. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, it's great. It's such a cool title. It just sounds, it sounds, it sounds smart and tough. It's got, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And you're like, but it, it ties back to family. Well, you know what? One of the things that I've always loved about you and, and about the band uh, is, is a strong sense of family. I feel like the band has always been a family too. Probably why we were always so close. It felt it was more than just a relationship with your A&R guy. It was family. You know what I mean? And freedom you know, night. Freedom, not <laughs> freedom, like, which I think we should tell people it was was so much fun. We were we we were on tour in Europe, right? And, and mm -hmm. we, uh, I remember I was I was just I was I was struggling in the relationship that I was in, and you guys said, "Hey, you know what, man? There's an extra bunk on the tour bus. Why don't you fly over to England?" And we stayed in the Columbia Hotel, of course, the first couple of nights, as so many bands do. The Columbia Hotel, you know, being that's where. Oasis wrote that song Columbia basically about that hotel. I mean, they, they, what, their first demo, but we were there that night and then you did Reading and Leeds. And then we, I went with you to Belgium and to France and to, and to Holland, to Amsterdam and Italy and Germany. And we, it was just, but freedom night was the thing where <laughs> we, were, 
Because, you know, it was crazy because we didn't, you know, oh, we stayed in the bus a lot of times. Freedom Night was the night we would rock out to Zeppelin uh, and other other hard rock uh, and stuff. And Freedom Night meant everybody's shirts were off, whether uh, for better or for worse. But it was so much fun. Uh, we, well, that tour was amazing. We, had so, we, we just had a blast. Those, you know... Those, you know, I bumped into, well, I don't bumped it. He actually lives in the neighborhood, but Todd Horn, we were talking about, because uh, he had bumped into us on that run. Uh, do you remember Todd? Yeah, in Paris, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and Todd, Todd actually, we, we, we visit, every, he comes by every once in a while, and we hang out and, and reminisce, and, uh, you know, he just had a baby, so. Um, but, yeah, he, he had brought up that night when, or, or that time we had, our paths had sort of converged, like, over there. Because um, we were we talked about freedom. Yeah, freedom <laughs> night. We were in Paris, we were only there for like 20 hours. I mean, literally for a sound check, two meals at the same restaurant. And remember, <laughs> it was so hot. And I think the other bands on the bill were like Yellow Card and New Found Glory. Uh, our Bouncing Souls were on some of the other bill uh, dates. It was always different. But um, <laughs> I remember there was one shower and everybody, it was the hot, it was the heat of the end of summer. And everybody was like, well, look, there's no towels here. So it was like, what T-shirt did you use to dry your, uh, <laughs> it was just like, it was, it was just funny. It was, it was great stuff. Yeah. Claudio, um, it's it, it, you, some of the, I just got to ask you, speak, being a dad now too, you know, with Atlas, I love the fact that there's this group that is doing lullaby versions of your songs and they've done welcome home. Right. Tell me about this. And isn't this album going to be called in keeping secrets of silent birth or something like yeah, that or something like that. <laughs> yeah. It's cool. Yeah. I love it. I mean, I think it, I'm not so sure it's the first time it's been done, but um, it's all, it's cool. I love hearing our songs sort of in any create, you know, recreated in any capacity. Um, I find it interesting. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I was just honestly, I wasn't that involved. I was just called and asked if it would be something that we were into having done, and, and I was like, "Yeah, sure, why not?" So that's amazing. Now, is it true that you know a, a good percentage of the next Coheed record is already written too? Because I know that I saw something. You said maybe three quarters of it were done, or yeah, um, I have. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Matt. Oh no, go ahead. You got um, it. Yeah, no, I have, uh, at the moment I have 11 songs, um, but I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm actually working very closely right now with Chase, the, uh, Chase Stone, the fellow that did the art and the concept materials for the last, uh, record, the Vaxxus one Unheavenly Creatures. So we've been, we've been actually working on that for a few months now and like just character design concepts, uh, locations, things like that. Just just to get all those things kind of all of the ducks in a row, because that, that actually was, is a lot of work, like conjuring up all those materials. So that's been, uh, worked on for, for, it's still being worked on for, uh, which has been for a while now. Um, and I've just been writing as, you know, on the side. And like I said, I have 11 songs. I'm not so sure all 11 songs make sense in terms of their position in terms of the second part of the story. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's there. It's happening. I love, I, you know, I gotta tell you, I love, I've already got, um, cause you know, Vaxxus is supposed to be a five part pentology. And, uh, and, um, when I, when I look back at the first Amory Wars, um, from, you know, year of the black rainbow to the no world for tomorrow story, I think about who I was as the person that wrote those things and, and the overall, uh, idea of that concept about, you know, just somebody f destined for, um, you know, for failure and destruction and in hope that maybe out of that, there's like a sense of redemption, you know, and that's, and that's kind of what happens like the, in the gist of that story. I mean, that's the theme, I think, you know, cause I didn't know who I was. I was developing as a human being, um, a lot of confusion. Am I good? Am I bad? That kind of stuff. Like, how do I translate that into a concept? And this one, because I'm a dad, um, not that I, I feel any more secure, but it's fun to write from that perspective as, as opposed to being, um, you know, the, the son, I'm now the father. And, uh, and it's fun because Vaxxus is basically Atlas, you know? Yeah. Um, and I see myself in creature and sister, Sp and I see my wife and sister spider and, uh, and, um, and the more I, I push forward with the characters that are reintroducing themselves or, or, um, 
or new ones that are that are being introduced it's it's just fun because i get to see this new form of my life now playing out in this piece of fiction you know but from a different angle yeah it's amazing you know i i remember back we were spending a lot of time together uh you know before in between uh in keeping secrets and good apollo volume one and I remember, you know, why, why you were coming up with those songs and just, uh, you know, even that period of time and, you know, things that were going on in your life. And it was amazing to watch the way that that record developed and how those songs all came out. I mean, it's, you know, it's one of my favorite records of all time, actually. And it's just, I mean, even being there when you played, I mean, I remember you playing Travis and I on the tour bus. Maybe Josh was asleep. Uh, I don't remember Michael, but I um remember that we actually were in tears. I mean, myself and and Travis, when we heard Wake Up, we were like, it made me cry. I mean, I love the song so much, you know? And I remember, I remember when you said to me, you're like, well, I go, what are you going to call the song? And you're like, well, I'm going to call it Wake Up. You keep calling it Wake Up. Because usually, you know, you call it something else. So I indirectly, un- unintentionally named the song, but it's such a beautiful song. It was, you know, but so many things on that record. But I love the way that you've always been able to take things that are going on in your real life and then and, and, and translate them and, and have them filter through into the stories, you know? Yeah. I mean, a lot of that just has to do with being insecure, right? I mean, I had no idea what it was like to be a front man, and it still took a long time to embrace that. But by the time I did, I realized how much fun I had, like, just, you know, translating it into this other world. Like, it just felt more important to me and, um, and fun. I mean, I did have an opportunity to be in a coheed, be on a coheed, like do a coheed record without the concept. And, and I thought that that was important, certainly for the time, the color before the sun, you know, being sort of like the emotions and feelings before my son was born, um, what life was like before that change. Um, so I thought that was important to do for that moment in time, but I did, I did miss like, you know, just bringing it in and, and molding it into something more fantastic. Yeah. Where do you like to record now when you guys, uh, do you still, when you go and record, do you record up in upstate New York, uh, sometimes, or do you go into New York city and do, where do you, where do you, where have you been recording the last couple records? Well, um, so, uh, color before the sun, we actually did in Nashville with Jay Joyce. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, so he didn't come to you guys. Yeah, you went down there. Then, yeah, right? we went down to Nashville. And it was like the first, you know, aside from like going to L.A. and working with Atticus and um, Joe Barisi, which was a great experience. Um, you know, that was the only other time. Oh, well, with Nick as well. Um, those were the this was the only other place other, aside from like New York or L.A. that we had gone that was you know, different Nashville. Um, but, uh, the last record we decided to self-produce and we went back up to Applehead where we had done most of those original records. And, uh, and that was great. I mean, I, I loved it. It was, you know, I got to go to the studio at like four or five in the morning, open up, sing, which I never really get to do all that much. I mean, that's when I feel like I'm the, my most productive and everyone's asleep. Um, like four so, in the morning, five, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm into it. Love it. Um, you know, it's a little difficult now in the city, but now that we have a house, you know, I, I get in here and I, I start demoing things pretty early and our, our neighbor doesn't seem to mind so much. And I'm at the back side of the house. So, uh, but, um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I try, I, you know, that's what I find in myself. Like, you know, it's usually like whether or not I feel like the day is going to be productive in this realm is if I yeah. get started early. Yeah, that's so. cool that you do. How did you like working with Atticus Ross too? I mean, was that a, a great experience? I mean, obviously, so I'm so you know, happy for him and Trent, you know, that they've not only won Oscars and, and just so many other things that they've done, but, you know, they're, and the great records. What was that experience like working with Atticus? Oh, it was great. I mean, so, I think it's probably, what's that, Matt? Uh, Joe's great too, Joe Bruce. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, I think that was my favorite you know, not to discredit all the other producers that I worked with, you know, uh, before or after, like, uh, but I just really enjoyed working with Atticus and Joe. Like they just brought a sense. It reminded me of like being younger and the idea of the happy accidents, you know, as a, when I was younger and recording with 
four tracks, not like I do now with all these DAWs and, and things like that. It's like the happy accident would always like kind of inform what the song wanted to be. And they kind of reminded me of that. Like I kind of lost that along the way. Um, and, uh, and I was reminded that, you know, just be open to all things. That's how I sort of perceived, you know, um, my, the experience. And, uh, you know, and at that time I was also really getting into sound and sound manipulation. I mean, a lot of these like synthesizers and modular thing over here, like a lot of that kind of stems from working on that year, the black rainbow record. Um, you know, no world was like my first real analog synthesizer. And I was always sort of interested, but I think when it came to that time of working with Joe and Atticus, that's when it kind of blew up a bit. Um, and, you know, I've really kind of adopted that forum um, and, you know, brought it into Coheed. Yeah, which is great. And, you know, I love the sound treatments and the different things that are on the record and that are done through that. Mm. You know, you know, it was cool. So, I mean, some of the fun things that you've done during the pandemic. Oh, by the way, you know, when we were talking about the new songs before, is there going to be a song called Hallelujah Pandemic? Because I know that was oh. something they pressed, or was that just like something that, you know, it's funny, like in September of last year, um, I started to write this song and man, I wish I had a clip of it. I would play it for you because I don't think it's going to make the record. I, I just felt like ultimately it, it um, you know, just it, it, after the fact, it just feels funky to me. Um, but I mean, who knows? We'll see. But I think I've written other songs that I think are cooler and more unique than than that one. Yeah, but that's cool. That's wild, though. And that was, like you said, it was it was a little while back. So yeah, and I was, and I, I have like emails to Blaze about pandemic, like just those, like the masks, like oh, we should do these masks. And can you imagine if all the kids and or all the fans were wearing the mask? Like it could be cool. <laughs> the sound, we're like, oh, and then it becomes <laughs> real. It becomes a life, <laughs> right? Exactly, it becomes the real way of life. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, oh. well, you're a forward thinker. There's no question. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, some of the fun things you've done during this pandemic, too. I love that cover that you guys did of Anthem by Rush from my favorite Rush album, Fly By Night, which was oh, right. That was fun. With, tell me how that came down with you working with the guys in Mastodon and Primus and everybody. How did they just reach out to you? How did that work out? Well, actually, Stephen Brodsky of Cave and hit me up he lives uh in one of the neighboring like i live in crown heights he lives up in greenpoint and, and you know before that situation we had been getting together and just like uh collaborating on some ideas you know and, and we formed like a friendship and he reached out um because i think you know two minutes to late night was you know they were considering doing a rush song and they had me in mind to sing it of course <laughs> like, oh my God. Yeah. um but uh uh but you know me and my my relationship with Rush. I'm, yeah, you know I'm not the biggest yeah. Rush fan, but I yeah, like people would think, <laughs> you are, but it's just like your nat natural voice. People would would say that. Oh, must be in a Rush, and it was like I said, no, but there's still <laughs> bands that I know he's actually really into. Not that you yeah. don't like Rush, but you have they weren't your biggest in influences. Like yeah, other. but uh, but then he he hit me up, he he hit me up and he said, you know, Bill from Mastodon was going to curate curate it and they were thinking of getting Les Claypool and Danny Carey and I was like oh, how do I say no to this I'm like you picked a Rush song yeah I'm like ah oh, could it be anything else um but well I mean I'm sure you because you get tired of the comparison type thing but but yeah, but, but I loved I loved it I gotta tell you like I I'm as much as I'm not a fan and I have my reasons or I am a fan but you know not not as as one would think but um but uh I just I realized how in you know it was it was a challenge like i hadn't sang in a long time like that um you know we're talking i think how old was getty lee when he cut that song like in his 20s and i'm yeah like 30, early 20s. yeah yeah it, i'm 42 like first record with neil pert and you know that was my favorite album of theirs because first one i ever heard yeah you know, kid and uh on, a, on like a sampler album uh and it had that in the title track five by night but yeah, I mean, it's great. And like you said, Danny Carey from Tool, too. What a great drummer. So, like, I mean, the crew, him and Les on bass. and I know. Oh. I mean, I was such a big fan of those bands and still am. Like, you know, Les Claypool, Primus, Danny Carey, Tool, you know, and our, you know, Mastodon guys, you know, we had... Your, 
we got to uh, tour with and became really good friends with. So I just thought the company and Steven too, as, uh, absolutely. Like it just like it, it felt like, you know, even though I had my apprehensions, it was a no brainer. So I, I did it. And, um, and man, it was hard. It was a lot of fun. It was challenging. Um, I mean, I was in this room, actually it was, di it was arranged differently. The desk was over there and, uh, I was sweating so much. Like it, it was an intense vocal performance, like dripping sweat. It doesn't help that this is an old house. It doesn't have air, air conditioning, but, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just, I kept coming out and looking at my wife and she's just like, what the hell? Like you're so beat up. And I'm like, this is hell. I'm in hell right now. <laughs> but it came out great. I mean, it uh, did. yeah, it did. I had such a great time. It's awesome. It was, it was awesome that you did that as well. And talk to me about the collaboration with Rick Springfield too, with Jesse's Girl too. Oh that, yeah, that was that was very cool too. You know, I mean, the thing is, I mean, there, you've always loved, and everybody in the band, you know, Travis, Josh, all the guys have always loved so many different types of music. Grew up on different things, so you know, uh, it was undeniable that the original Jesse's Girl was a great pop song, and it was just one of those songs that you, that, you know, uh, you know, you hear, and the minute you hear those those chords you were a fan of when you were younger, right? So tell me how that whole thing came about. Cause you know, obviously he's, he was in the, you know, the documentary on sound city. It was great in that when he did that with Dave Grohl and those guys. Um, and I just think, you know, he's just a cool guy, right? You know, so tell me about how that all came down. Um, so last year we went into the studio to just um, see if anything would happen. Cause you know, normally we don't, a lot of the writing takes place in my spot and I wanted to see if anything had come from like the band sort of collaborating together. Um, and, uh, and so we did, we did that and we got a bunch of bits and things like that. It was, it was, it was a really fun experience, but at the end we started to jam on something that, that just kind of felt just really straight ahead. Um, and I started, you know, singing as a placeholder, Jesse's girl, not the, not the original melody, but the one that you hear in the song, like, you know, for some reason, you know, the melody, um, called up those syllables from those words and I just kept singing it. And then I, I thought, well, you know, what if, what if we did a sequel to somebody else's song, you know, like pr directors do it all the time for movies, you know, um, you know, so why not try to do that? And then we started, you know, talking about the idea of maybe doing a record that fell outside of the concept that would be a collection of single or a collection of sequels of other people's material, you know, really going down the crazy lane. Um, but that uh, would be cool, though. That would, yeah. That would be really cool. Yeah. Call it sequels. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe in the future. But um, we, uh, so so we did it we left the studio and i put the vocals together at the apartment um and then uh and then we kind of put it aside like we didn't really do much with it it just sat in storage and um and then the pandemic hit and i thought you know we got this song um i'm gonna send it to somebody to get mixed and see if it comes back you know in a different like form if it shed some light on it um and it did and blaze really liked it um and he suggested you know maybe you know getting rick involved um and i thought of course i mean that would um validate it being a sequel it would just make it feel more um real and uh and rick seemed seemed game and and so we did it and he was you know d was down to star in the video um he is, he's a really, really cool guy. Um, you know, it could have gone, you know, the other way, of course, but it was like so pleasant. Um, and he liked the song and, and I, I don't know, I thought it was, I thought it was great. It was like the perfect, um, as he, as Rick would put it, he was like, it's lightning in a bottle. And I, and I agree with him, you know? Yeah. It came out really fun. You know, you know, I think about you, some of the cool covers you guys have done over the years, you know, what are some of your favorite covers that you've done? I remember, remember when you were doing the trooper live, which was always really great, you know, when you would do maiden, but what I mean, even when it, I remember the, it was part of, I think the AB club, you did dismiss a rush of push in the oh, land, yeah. of which is such a great Smith song. Mm -hmm. Was that something you just, a song that you would love that you said, like, well, let's do this. Well, you know, they they had like a list of songs. Like that was a part of 
you know, you know, it wasn't like we had made the selection. They were just like, these are our list of songs for whatever thing they were promoting. And we just happened to choose the Smiths tune. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, my favorite, I mean, of the covers, I just recently did it not too long ago. It's not going to make it on the prize fighter record, but I did a stand by me cover, which I thought was kind of cool because it, it was all with the module modular synth. So it's really like kind of sterile and scary and, yeah. um, you know, I think uh, some of my, you know, honestly, some of my favorite, you know, Kohi covers are really like the covers when everything was done on a four track, you know, the Sister Christian, which I don't know if anybody's ever heard, or um, that outfield tune, um, Your Love. Yeah. You know, I mean, those happen to be my favorite just because they were never really meant to be anything and i think that was like pre like coheed as a rock band um uh but i'm trying to think of if you would know better than i what covers yeah. we did yeah honestly like no i know but it's, it's, it's <laughs> all you, do. it's it, you know it's I, I always i always love the different ones that you guys had done hey so at the first with, with travis and josh and the guys uh you know are you in touch with them pretty regularly have you have you got to see each other at all during this pandemic uh, uh, yeah, we do. You know, I see Travis a lot. Um, Cause you get the kids together, right? We do. Yeah. And Travis lives in, um, in Nyack where we're all sort of from. And so I go up there to visit my folks as often as I can. So I do see Travis. Um, I talked to Josh on the phone the other day, you know, about the new record and potentially demoing out some drums and things like that. Um, I text Zach here and there. Uh, yeah. I talk to blaze like every day. Um, yeah, we're talking about for those people watching, you probably might not now, you know, Blaze James is the band's manager and has been really from the beginning. It's yeah. been a family that's you know been unbreakable, and I love that. I think it's one of the great things about it, you know. I, I was talking about your wedding when you were, I think it was a Suffian Stevens song when you were when you guys were walking up. Uh, do you remember? Oh, yeah, you? absolutely. Right, well, of course, you remember it's your wedding, but it was. Oh. Like, that was an incredible, incredible day. I, I, I'm just never forget how, how much I love that. You know, um, so, you know, when you, because you did the Never Ender before, which was amazing when you, when you did, the, you know, the first um, three albums and you've done, and I remember, of course, one of the last times that I actually saw you, we were in, in the same place, which was amazing, was when you were doing Good Apollo, uh, Volume 1, From Fear Through the Eyes of Madness, when you were touring that, remember when I was on the radio in San Francisco, I was doing mornings there. I was, actually, I was doing mornings, nights, everything. But I remember how great I saw you guys there in Oakland. Uh, you did that and you did the whole album. Are there, um, are there plans when you come back to do any of the other albums all the way through again at this point? Or do you think you'll, you'll go out and just do a proper tour with the next record that you do? Yeah, it's tough to say. Like we were supposed to do Never Ender. Um, no world for tomorrow this year and that got canceled yeah. but you know i think we want to i mean there's always going to be time and ne never ender has sort of become a thing um within the band's dna um you know going yeah. back and tributing records so we'll probably do it eventually but i think coming out um you know i think i think the focus right now is is a record so um i'm not so sure we want to push that back um yeah, so, yeah we'll see I think that's great, though. Have you, as far as making a new record, Claudio, have you thought about who you might want to produce? Um, do you think you might end up doing a lot of this stuff yourself because you're, you know, you're in that situation of lockdown and it's and you, it's pretty sequestered? Do you think that's something you might consider? I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, we had such a good time doing the last record. It is a, it, you know, it, it, it's definitely a possibility, um, you know, but some of the material that I'm writing right now, um, you know, it feels, it does feel new for the band. Um, so I want to keep an open mind um, for how, you know, how to execute, you know, in terms of the producer, you know, department of the, of the record. Um, so we'll see, uh, you know, like when I demo the material, it's, pretty much you know it's more than it used to be it used to be like just kind of a shell like travis was saying they, i keep saying like oh they're skeletons of the songs he's like <laughs> and he's just like laughing because you know sometimes it is just a swollen shell like it's <laughs> you know there's a lot of stuff in there um so uh 
So sometimes, you know, we'll just take these sessions, bring them to the studio and then kind of elaborate on them, you know, pull things out, redo certain things. Um, so in a way it is written, but I think, I think it, it might need a new set of eyes on it. So we'll see. Or yeah. ears. You still have time, which is really yeah about that, you know? I mean, I love the fact that one of the things you've always done for fans is you always make it, a, you know, people that are fans of Coheed are, are really, it's a lifestyle and they get into the experience of it. So you always give them something extra. I mean, there are, you know, there'd be special editions uh, that come out of the different great albums, uh, you know, and I mean, remember that amazing box set for the first Never Ender. Remember that was just a, I'm thinking back about that, how incredible that was. But um, with, uh, you know, with the writing of, of the graphic novels and stuff, are you working on anything on, in that area right now as well? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my wife and I are, Chandra, um, we're scripting No World, the No World for Tomorrow story, which is the finale of the Coheed and Cambria portion of the Amory Wars. Um, yeah. So we've been, we've been writing that. I mean, we are kind of hoping to be further along than we, than we are, but, you know, because, you know, all of last year, pretty much we were the school year. Anyway, we were teaching our son from home, you know, remotely. So it, it kind of put, pushed things off, but we're about four or five issues into, uh, the scripting that, and that's supposed to be a 12 issue maxi series. Um, I also partnered with, um, Steve Niles, um, and we started to adapt, um, the, my brother's blood machine story that, counterparted to the uh that first prize fighter record um yeah. so that's actually being illustrated right now um so uh we're about an issue in there um and you know and i've been outlining the vaxis stories did you ever get a vaxis box set the first box set yeah, I, need, I, well, I gotta get oh it. matt it's incredible like just the art is insane chase stone the fellow that illustrated it is actually from my hometown where I grew up, we're about 10 years apart, but, um, He's like, just, like, in the Kingston, Nyack area, right? Right around there. No, well in Rockland. Oh, cause Rock I'm from Nyack. Rockland. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, but it's, it, you know, it looks like, it just looks like a feature, you know? Um, so Shawnee and I, you know, worked on that, that, and now we're, you know, plotting out the outline for, um, for the follow up, which is Vaxis 2. I can't, um, I have a working title that's the sub, but um, but we'll see. And uh, and yeah, I've been working with Chase just like on those illustrations, new characters, new locations, things like that. And uh, and yeah, so that story is progressing. Um, cool. Yeah, so we got you know we got some things were you know worked. Actually, hold on. I don't know if you've seen these yet, but we started to do. Coheed and Cambria dolls. Yeah, which I thought was amazing. I, I, you know, I, I read about them and I've got to get them. I've got to have them in my house, you know? Yeah. And by yeah. the way, I mean, I don't know if people watching know this, but, you know, I mean, I made a deal with the guys years ago. I said, you know, I know these records are going to go gold. And I just, because I felt so close to the band as friends and we were brothers, uh, I, I remember 13 years before it actually I did it, but I said to you guys, I go, man, if good, when Good Apollo goes gold, I go, I'm getting the dragonfly on my calf tattoo. So I do have a, I have a dragonfly on my leg. I, I do have the Kohi dragonfly. I got the tattoo. I don't know if I can show it up there to people, but here, you can kind of see it, right? Oh, it's a mess. There we go. Can you see it? Yeah, it's I see it. It's yep, there. there it we got it. Holy mackerel. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's, that's commitment, right? Claudio? Absolutely. <laughs> I got a Klaus Nomi tattoo on my leg. <laughs> Do you really? Yeah. I never knew you were a fan of Klaus Nomi. Klaus did Nomi. You? Look at this nasty sock. Did you? Did Klaus they, did, Nomi. Did you like, did you ever see the Klaus Nomi performance we did with Bowie on Saturday Night Live? Oh yeah, absolutely. I have like yeah. the original, I have that on VHS with like all the original commercials from like 1979 or whatever it was uh, when he did Lodger before yeah. scary monsters yeah it was pretty amazing no but it's cool uh that you do that so tell me about these dolls too because that those things are great yeah so um yeah so they're done up by NECA um yeah. and yeah it's Coheed and Cambria you know yeah. um you know this is the the likeness taken from the second stage turbine blade story um you know Coheed comes with blades and the arm cannon and um 
Cambria has some like, you know, pow, you know, her like sort of telekinetic uh, power bubbles happening. And yeah. yeah, that's them. Yeah, it's amazing. That's so cool that they did that. I mean, I remember in the very beginning when the first Amory Wars graphic novel came out, we were doing like an in-store. You guys were in New York City, remember? And people were lined up down the street. It was, it was a really great turnout, right? Yeah, it was awesome. Um, I mean, what's that? Oh no, I was going to say. So, do you find you, you you find a lot of the people that have that have been fans and have followed you or have been following the story? Do you get a lot of correspondence from those from those people, Claudio? Um, like when you mean correspondence, like, like people re like reaching out and saying how much they appreciate and love the. Uh, oh, absolutely. You know, whether it's on social media or in person, or um, you know, yeah, um, you know, when you it's it's really interesting when characters are now you know the inspiration for names of children you know the ambolinas i've met the coheed and cambrias i've met um i met twin co a twin set coheed and cambria um they, they named their kids that's fantastic yeah. isn't that amazing i mean yeah. you know, it's got to be just a, a great feeling right yeah absolutely i've met an owl the killer no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> I'm a killer man going back. Wow. Well, that's no. <laughs> you know, um, but so, so tell me, so being a, being a dad w with Atlas as he's getting bigger, uh, have you noticed his interest in music? Is he like, is he a fan? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he plays with all of these things. Um, for a while, his favorite um, synthesizer was the ARP Odyssey, which is yeah. like over there in the corner, but then he moved over to the 2600. That's become his, his go-to. Um, you feel he, like that's his, the natural ability to perform, right? Yeah, he, so, you know, um, because I'm not that proficient in uh, any instrument, really. Um, but, uh, like, you know, I was learning sort of scales on piano, and he happened to take an interest. And so I just did all the majors and minors. Um, and he can now call them out with his ear, which I can't do. Um, so, you know, you play a scale for him and he'll call it out. And I mean, I could never do that. Um, so that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, other than that, I mean, yeah, he, he's, he's interested. Um, but, uh, you know, kids like they come in and out of things, you yes, know? Yeah, you know, how's it been homeschooling him? You know, because, uh, obviously, you know, a lot of your fans are, 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 are parents as well. Has that been, uh, has it been a challenge or has it been, has it been, some of it been good? Cause I mean, I know keeping kids, you know, like focused on a zoom call or things like that. What, what is it? What has that been like for you? I think at first it was difficult. Um, but he's also, um, he's, he's into it. You know, he's, uh, he seems to get it and is totally fine learning remote. I mean, at the moment, um, he does go in person, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, um, you know, so, uh, Wednesday's really only his remote day. Um, but before that, yeah, it was, uh, you know, all week. Um, but he was, he, he, he seems to be fine. It's not a, an issue. You know, I've, I've heard some, you know, nightmares from other parents, but, uh, um, he seems to be okay with it. Yeah. One of my favorite moments was when, uh, I, I was in Phoenix and you guys, it was you, Coheed, it was, and Primus and Tool, and you guys were all playing that gigantic outdoor show, and it was incredible because you know, uh, both you know, both your wives, uh, you and Travis, it had uh, the boys would like literally on you know those as everybody like I'm one of those like kind of look like telephone wires because you know just so like they can run around, but yeah, <laughs> it's almost like a leash. I mean, look, we everybody, <laughs> it, it's important. but they were kidding and they were watching their dads on stage, and it was just what a, a great, beautiful moment, you know. Yeah, I thought, man, cool, you know, it was amazing. But Claudio, this is uh, this is great. I mean, I'm so glad that you, you you're taking the time to hang with me on the show today. Thanks for having I mean, me. I, I remember how funny it was that I was texting you that tattoo as I was getting it. Remember? Yeah. Those nice pictures. But I made that promise 13 years earlier, and then I finally did it. You know, I, I wanted to be a man of my word. So, <laughs> so it came through, and it's uh, – I like – because I've always loved that. Man, that dragonfly is just, you know, that and the keys are so, so cool. Hey, you know, so one of the things we do on the show, um, but I, and I give the artists options, you know, um, to – 
talk about, you know, their favorite records of all time, or it doesn't have to be their favorite. It could be their seven favorite albums of a decade, of a style, of a year, of just whatever, something that they is inspirational to them that they can tell stories about. So with yours, because, you know, it's, I know how hard it is. I mean, look, even in my mm. book, where there's a chapter about you guys in my book, in my, in my memoir, um, even for the decades, I had to put 50 records for each decade, which was almost impossible, right? I mean, it was, I mean, I, I went, oh, I forgot that record. But at the same time, you know, it's just, it's good for your fans and, and people to hear about some of the records that mean so much to you. Cause you know, that's, isn't it music that's gotten us through everything? I mean, you know, there's no question about it. Yeah. So what I love about these, they aren't your favorite albums of all time, but they have memories that counterpart uh, that are significant to you. So, you know, and I, I'm sure it was one of those things where maybe when, when we sent you that request that it was that week, that day or that night, cause you could think of different, yeah. things, different days, you know, totally. instead yeah. of putting the label on it that it's your your favorites uh seven favorites but they're all great so i'm gonna start at the top with this and talk to you about it now i love this because what a run it's the beatles anything from rubber soul to abbey road which i think <laughs> is cool you know what i mean uh i i mean who doesn't love those records and would you would agree like at rubber soul was when they started to take that turn where things not only did they add more acoustic but they got even more introspective in a way from some of the original pop. Why, why do you love that period of the Beatles so much? Well, yeah. And Abbey road. And when I say Abbey road, I tech, cause Abbey road is technically the last record that they did. Yeah. I mean, released was let it be, let it be. So let it be is in there as well. Just in, yeah. But, uh, you know, it just, that was a band I had, um, you know, I, I think maybe the first band I started to, uh, dissect. Yeah. Um, and you know, when I think of like, that whole conspiracy of Paul being dead, you know, yeah. and all of the like little imagery that you could find in, in the album covers, whether it was Sergeant Pepper or Abbey road with the license plate saying 28 if, and them dressed in their, you know, from the grave digger to the Paul bearer, yada, yada, yada. I mean, just things like that. I, I found that so interesting, whether it was true or not, like, um, I think it might have been like the initial things that sort of informed me into what actually writing to a concept is. And not that that's what they were doing, but the the fact that it was being perceived that way. Like you could take, um, what is it, like Sgt. Pepper and, sh and put it in the mirror and something, ha I can't remember exactly what it is, but something happens backwards. Do you know, know yeah. Matt? You would have to know. Right. What happens? Uh, you know what I'm talking about? You mean, you mean as far as what it looks like? You mean as far as... Yeah. Isn't there like a message? Yeah. I can't remember. You know, I had that... I mean, we're going back like I think I was in junior high. Yeah. Um, well, I remember there were so many different things, you know, like with uh, I Buried Paul. I, I mean, like, and all those, you know. And I think, believe it or not, that whole rumor where the Beatles started on um, Rutgers University at the college radio station that I was on, that was the first place where they started the whole rumors about Paul being dead at that radio station. Oh, really? And then a New York station, ABC, the top 40 station, the overnight DJ went off and just did the whole thing. And they actually escorted him out of the radio station uh, with the police and management in the morning and got on the radio and said, uh, basically said he was out of his mind in a kind way and said, we, we don't agree with uh, what he's done and uh, and we've relieved him of his job. <laughs> so it started <laughs> and came from that. But yeah, I can't remember exactly what that was. Uh, yeah, I also think, you know, the Beatles also, in, you know, when I was in high school, like, you know, you I thought of the Beatles, I thought of like um, Sergeant Pepper, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And I remember being like, you know, if there's a drug I want to do before I do anything, it's like acid. And and I, and, you know, and I did, I did, uh, you know, I, I attempted twice, got bum tabs. Um, but I went for acid before I tried any other, like, <laughs> like a lunatic, like, let me go do this and not have any like frame of reference. Um, but yeah, the Beatles informed my drug use. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> Sorry. That's great though. I love it. That's amazing. Now the next record that you picked was Axis Bold as Love. Uh, Hendrix's second album. And what a great record this is. It's one of my favorites. It's interesting because, you know, when I think about what you write and you write and the things that you write with, 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 with you know, with futuristic and science fiction and, uh, you know, Hendrix loved reading novels about science fiction. He was, 
so into that. And, you know, it, it, there were the stories of him being on planes, reading these paperbacks all the time. And, you know, he, he was really into it. And this is such a great record. I mean, it's, I know that you love it like I do, because we've talked about it before. I mean, things like Castles Made of Sand. I mean, it's poetry besides the playing. So tell me why, why you love it, Claudio. Yeah, I mean, I didn't want to be redundant and say anything, Jimi Hendrix, like I did the Beatles. But uh, I yeah. love all Hendrix. Um, you know, I think I like this one because it's a it's a transitional record between, you know, Are You Experienced and Electric Ladyland. It's a softer side of Hendrix. And, you know, the first time I, I listened to Jimi, um, I had heard Little Wing. But I had I had heard Sting's rendition of Little Wing, um, and I remember when I actually heard the original, being like kind of confused. You know, this is oh, this must be Sting's song. You know, it was young, um, and uh, and you know, I just I kind of went down the Jimmy hole. Jimmy, oh, Jesus, <laughs> who am I? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, you know, I just I, everything about you know, Hendrix in terms of the way he played the guitar, the sound of it, um, you know, even like all along the watchtower and the wah pedal in, in that, like, you know, it was like really kind of the first time I had thought about guitar as a form of expression. Um, and I think on this record, you know, because of, of like all the clean playing and not what you, you usually think about with Hendrix, I think that made this record kind of special to me. Yeah, it's a, it's an incredible one. Now I love that you picked the John Frusciante solo record. In, in fact, his first one, uh, which was uh, you know Neandro Ledes, and usually just a T-shirt, which I I gotta say is, uh, you know he, you know the times that I've met and talked to John when you know and and mentioned things about his solo records, he's always so grateful that somebody actually paid attention to those records, and this was really him kind of reaching into the avant-garde too and, and doing some different things and, you know, basically on a four track. Tell me why this record is so important to you. Be, because that was, you know, it it taught me that the four track is an instrument, you know, like the atmosphere of that album. Like I remember listening to me like, I have that at home, you know, I could make records like this, you know? Um, and I think it was just an important, it was like a soundtrack to a lot, to the friends group. I, you know, been a part of in in high school um so i think that's why i mean i thought the music touched me in a way that like i don't know nothing else had and it felt even though it felt foreign it felt very familiar because i i had i had the tools um to create something like it um so yeah yeah that's cool exactly like you know you've got the guitar you've got the four track and it's uh yeah i, lo I like the fact that it was cool that rick rubin was and American records were, were just so willing to put out and do and let him, you know, do his solo records and, and supported him as an artist. And I thought that was great. I mean, he's such a great guitar player, too. Now, you know, the next record is one that uh, we both love because you know what a fan of this band's I am. Thin Lizzy's Dedication, which is the uh, which is a compilation album. It's actually, you know, um, it's Thin Lizzy's. It's a, it's, a, it's just kind of kind of a singles comp. It's not all their singles, but it's just a great compilation. Talk to me about why you love Thin Lizzy. Phil well, um, so this, this record more so because of the song dedication. So I was, that was my introduction to Thin Lizzy. I was watching an episode of Headbangers Ball and yeah. dedication was a video that played on the episode. And I remember thinking, oh, wow, it's like a Hendrix for, I mean, I was young again, middle school. Like, so I definitely wasn't thinking like this. I was just like, you know, this is like a, maybe, maybe this is like a Hendrix for a more modern day. And then I re I found out that, you know, Phil had passed away, but I loved that song. And I know it wasn't, I think it was like kind of put together after he had passed. Right, right on that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, but it's a, it's a great, like, it's got a hook to it. Like, and that's yeah. the, that was the bait that got me um into thin lizzy um and yeah i mean i i fell in love with it and i bought that compilation from a sam goody on tape and i i listened to it over and over again and you know and uh, you know as as i did when i was younger you know if i had a song that i liked i would just you know um until finally you know realizing that maybe i should uh move into the rest of the collection yeah and you did of course oh absolutely i love Thin Lizzy. I mean, you know, 
there are definitely Coheed songs where I try to emulate Phil. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, things like, I mean, you know, I think some, and some of the things like 10 speed, there were some others, you know what I mean? You can, yep. you can definitely hear it, which is great. Now the next record you picked was Misfits, uh, Legacy of Brutality. And, uh, I'm sure you could have picked a lot of different Misfits records you like a lot, but th- tell me why this one was one that you were thinking about. So when I started, um, so when I was in my first band, uh, one of the fellas, um, either his father worked at or his father knew somebody that did, but they worked at a tape manufacturing plant um, that manufactured Caroline Records um, cassettes. And so when we would go over to this house and rehearse, there was, you know, a wall of of tapes and uh we would take you know uh, you know and go home and listen and learn basically how to play music at least that's that's what i did um you know and i remember a few of them like it was like naked reagan uh gay bikers on acid um the meat men there was just a whole yeah. ton of stuff but yeah. the one that really stood out to me was this one and yeah. i feel like this sort of gave me an idea of you know song structure you know it was easy to play um you know it was a lot of power chords you know i learned i learned how to write songs from this record yeah isn't it funny how when you're a kid you you know it's that thing you find stuff in other people's houses or their brothers and sisters have or something like that where it's their where their parents you know what i mean or, or you know somebody who works somewhere and just you're so hungry for music, right? Especially back in those days when, you know, you didn't have the access that you have today to get everything uh, that you do. So through streaming, but uh, that's amazing. So Jane's Addiction, Ritual de la Habitual is the, is the album that you picked, which is uh, their third album, actually, their, their second major label one. And what a great record that is. Tell me why this record is important to you, Claudia. Uh Side B. Like there's, uh, you know, I love the whole record, but side B um, and three, I, I don't know if is three days on side A, is that end side A, um, but classic girl, um, yeah. you know, that was a very like important song to me. I think when, you know, I felt like I was in love, like classic girl was the soundtrack to those moments, you know, but three days also felt like Stairway to Heaven, like the sequel to Stairway to Heaven to me, yeah. you know, and it also kind of informed me that you can you know, like Stairway to Heaven, they're like practically two songs, you know, in a in a compound tune. You know what I mean? You have the structure of, of part A and then you have the structure of the out, which is part B. And that's what, you know, it reminded me of of like uh, a Stairway to Heaven for for my time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it... um, three days did. Uh, but a classic girl, that whole second side, I just thought it was such a, a beautifully constructed record. I mean, one of my favorite bands you know i know the bands that i was in in high school we emulated like if it wasn't guns and roses it was jane's addiction so yeah two really important great bands and the next one you picked was uh was a combination of two records basically that uh you know uh melancholy and the infinite sadness the a the epic double album that actually just came uh, it celebrated its 25th anniversary just about a week ago and uh and then that b-sides compilation which and and, and you know like it was called Pisces Iscariot, which was great. It had that cover of Landslide on it, you know, yeah. which they did in two takes at the BBC because they told them they only had 10 minutes. So oh. like, they literally, <laughs> Billy Corgan told me that story. He goes, yeah, they told me I had 10 minutes and we, I just laid it down and they, we, we just took the lead from one take and the rest of it was just live. So, but they did a great version of Landslide, right? I mean, yeah. Cool. Oh my God. It's amazing. I mean, yeah, that, that's why I, I put Pisces Iscariot on here. Um, you know, Pisces Iscariot, uh, Nirvana's Incesticide, like these were like, the, again, like these records told me, like taught me the importance of, of the demo process and, um, and, and, you know, and sharing them. You know, I now every Coheed record, I always share the demos in some capacity because I just think that they're important. They, you know, um, and again, yeah, this, I mean, I, I remember a time where a friend's group would just listen to Landslide over and over again. It was like an important, so I remember being, and I don't want to bring a, well, I, I remember one of the times I was tripping and waking and like staying up all night and watching the sun rise over the Hudson River and he, listening to that record, that collection of, of B-sides and how, and that feeling I had, um, it was beautiful being young. And I mean, I, I, I go back to those moments and, you know, the, like 
being outside all night and feeling like the change of day and the, the, the like you know the moisture on your body i love it um but uh yeah uh, but I mean, uh memory, right there's those things that are associated with those memories with the songs that you love and yeah places, you know but melancholy so melancholy um the day that came out um you know i was in an art class in high school where you know around halloween you know you were if you know if you had like a good pitch or a good piece of art that you wanted to put on a storefront window um you could get the opportunity to do that um, and skip a day of school. So, um, you know, spend your day painting. So I did that. And that day, Melancholy came out. And so I got a copy of it because, um, you know, around the time, I, I think like the stores were opening early or you could get, um, you know, so we went, got got a copy of it, went to my storefront window and I, I painted for, you know, listening to this record all day. And now anytime this, t and now when the fall happens um, and the way the lights sort of shine on all the greenery, I can't, I can't help but think of melancholy and the infinite sadness. Um, just, it's just, you know, stapled on this season of the year for me. And it just reminds me of, of, you know, being in that town, doing a piece of art, which by the way, I never finished. I just ended up like, I, at the time, my girlfriend was, uh, was painting at the bank next door. So I just really wanted to do it to listen to music and kind of be in the proximity of my girlfriend, yeah. you know? So, yeah. um, <laughs> of course it's important. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. That's great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just love, I just love that it, you know, it's stapled to, a, a time in my life and a season. I think that's really cool. Yeah, it, it, is, it is so great. I can't believe it's, it's 25 years. I can believe it's 25 years, but it's great. Now, you picked a staple next. Uh, and speaking of concept albums, you know, Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, which uh, for a long time was probably the longest running album on the Billboard album chart for, for years. It never, I mean, people were just, it meant more people were discovering it or buying second copies. But it was, uh, such an important record to so many people. Tell me why you love the club. I think I think it's the the synthesizers. Um, that's why this room is the way it is. You know, I I, um, I think on the run, you know, that sequence, you yeah. know, just such a it just I think it it spurred it it spurred my curiosity for for synthesis, I guess, you know. Um, you know, and and just just the things that they would conjure up when you would, when listening to it and the lights were off, you know, I love records like that. Um, and it's been a long time since I've experienced a record like that. You know, I think this happens to be one, um, you know, clearly the wall, anything kind of in the pink floor, the animals, whatever have you. But this is, this is the one that I think, you know, just reminds me of what is it? The VS, um, three synthy, uh, you know, sequence on, on the run. It just, it's again, it's just the visuals that come um, when the lights are off. Yeah. Uh, but the other records I think would be like, yes is fragile or, you yeah. know, um, uh, night at the opera by queen. Yeah. Um, but you know, Pink Floyd, I just, you know, one of my favorite bands of all time. I mean, clearly, I mean, I, I write concept records. Yeah. I'm not the first yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, so speaking of queen night at the opera i mean obviously that's another one that's uh, an album that takes you on a journey so talk to me about that i mean I, I i saw that tour when i was a kid 1976 the beacon theater in new york city and I, my mind was blown because they were so great live you know yeah and this album and the one right before it sheer heart attack were just so i mean i love queen too all of those but um that was a tour for those first four albums. So I was like, it was just, I mean, one of my favorite live shows I've ever seen, to be honest with you. So. Queen two, man. Fairy yeah. Feller's master stroke. Yep. Right after ogre battle. That's you know? a, that, that's an honorable mention. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is some, that's, that's some great songwriting there. Um, <laughs> but uh, night at the opera. So queen wasn't a band I grew up with. Right. Um, queen was introduced to me um, in the way I like queen right now. Uh, by Michael Birnbaum, the fella that um, uh, produced the first few Coheed records. Yeah. Um, you know, Mike turned me on a night at the opera. We were in his truck, we were driving, and he played uh, Death on Two Legs. And again, another one of those moments where, you know, it's it's kind of dark, you know, and we're just sitting, you know, we're sitting in the car, we're listening, and just 
ideas, thoughts, pictures, visuals are coming into my mind, you know, when you hear that guitar, like doing its thing. And so I, I kind of fell in love with death on two legs and, and every night while making, um, silent earth three, cause that was the record he had introduced me to it. Yeah. Um, I would listen to night at the opera in hopes that some of like prophet song would rub off on me. Cause I wasn't, I wasn't much of a, uh, harmonic singer in terms of like adding harmonies and things like that. I mean, I do it a lot now, but I think that's the first record where I really started to incorporate them into the songs. And, and I think Prophet Song had a lot to do with that. Um, and obviously, uh, uh, Night at the Opera, um, Bohemian Rhapsody, sorry, Night at the Opera, I meant to say Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, you know, uh, but yeah, that's just one of those, one of those records, you know, yeah, um, Prophet Song, I remember seeing it live and, you know, I'm, him doing the vocals on both sides of the stage. They were they would do the when they played live back then, throw the vocals like open you know with now I'm here and then now I'm here and now I'm there and go side to the stage and of course he did the whole thing with the vocal beat rolling over itself during profits. So it was so great, no question. Yeah. You know another another one that I'd like to throw out there and more so because I just thought about it um, not too long ago was uh, the Who's Tommy, and not because I was a big fan of the Who, but when I was in when I first started high school, we got a chance to see the Who, um, Tommy on Broadway. And I never really, I remember really enjoying it, but never kind of equating it to a, an, a rock album, you yeah. know? Um, and so I just think about that every once in a while, like, oh, wow, I, I had actually seen a rock opera play out in front of me, you know, probably before I'd seen any concert. You know, I'm probably pre like my first concert was like Black Sabbath at the Beacon Theater. So, um, you know, so so yeah, I'm gonna throw an honorable mention in there. Yeah, you and you should, you know. I mean, <laughs> you know, and Quadrophenia, who I know. Oh yeah, we, we've had that conversation. You, me, and Travis Mashing. here, and have talked about that match. Which we, I think, I know we listened to it on on the road in Europe on tour. In the bus, we definitely were blasting Quadrophenia one, one, at least one of those nights. You know, I got I got to thank you, Claudio, for coming by and doing this today, or for and taking the time, man. I just I, I really appreciate it, and I love seeing you. You know what I mean? It's great because uh, yeah, I think about you and Chandra and Atlas all the time, yeah. and um, you know, and I'm excited about the new stuff. I've got to get that special edition of that record. I can't believe. It. Yeah. Um, I mean, I got to do. I'm, I'll just so I can order it from Amazon. No, or, I, we'll get you one. All right, yeah, I gotta yeah, get of that. Of course, no question. Um, yeah, it's so cool. It looks so good. Yeah, I gotta see all that artwork that you guys did. I, I mean, it's gonna be unbelievable, Chase. Uh, but listen, Claudio, thank you so much for doing the show. It was so great to have you on. I always love talking music with you, and I'm glad you got to, you know, let your fans know about some of the other things that you've been up to. And you know, I'm glad you're doing well. I'm glad the family's all doing well. And uh, and say hi to the rest of the guys for me. Some I loved everybody. Absolutely. Right. Travis says hello too. By the way, I told him yeah. we were going to be talking today. So yeah, I got to reach out. I'm going to reach out to him. I definitely have to give him a call. Yeah, a when all this is you know hopefully like away and you're in town, man, let us know. I'm in the city now, so it's yeah. When I come back to town, we'll definitely hang. We'll have dinner. We'll, we'll do yeah something cool. You know, it'd be great. And it'd be great to see Atlas again. He's getting big, man. You know, oh, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to pull him out of the cart today. It was like. Oh, there it goes see you later shoulder <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing right, well thanks again i appreciate it claudia for doing this today man you got it matt thank you for having me yeah take care of you it was great claudio sanchez everybody it was uh so great to have claudio today you know it's uh, a long-term friendship um he's written so many great songs and uh and you know as an artist in every aspect in every sense of the word there's no question about it and uh we look forward to uh, the next Coheed record and the full length new Prize Fighter Inferno, which will be great as well. Anyway, uh, I'm Matt Pinfield. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is in a lonely place. And remember, I say this every time you're never lonely if you have music in your life, because it'll get you through anything. Thank you so much for watching today from everybody here at Rolling Live Studios and myself. I hope you have a great one, and we'll see you next time.